Let's take our Bibles and locate Psalm 126. Psalm 126. We continue this morning with our series through the Psalms of Ascent. Just a reminder, these Psalms in their origin um, vary. Some are of David. Uh, Others, we don't know. Some were written by Solomon. Others, there's, there's no clue really as to who originally penned them. But all take their place in on the written word of God and all are for our edification and encouragement. The Psalms vary also in their purpose, at least in terms of how people see the purpose of them. Uh, going back um, to when uh, they would have initially been sung or read, perhaps as well, some say they were sung as people climbed the steps to the temple in Jerusalem. Others say that these psalms were sung on the long journey people would have faced from um, outside of the city as they went to the festivals or feasts and that took place in Jerusalem. Really, the purpose and the wheres of when they were sung don't matter all that much. I actually think um, it could be a both and situation. There were people who lived in Jerusalem. They could have and probably would have sung these psalms as they ascended the steps into the temple on Mount Zion. Others would have sung and read these psalms as they made their long journey. What was in view if certainly no physical journey of uh, difficulty and pain was in, in mind, was certainly the reality of the spiritual difficulties, the spiritual battles, the spiritual pains that God's people experienced. We've already seen cases of distress and despair. Psalm 120, In my distress I called to the Lord. In Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? There's a need for help. There's a cry out. Help me. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalm 122 is a glad psalm. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord, this one who has helped us, who has delivered us faithfully, even when we have been dwelling in uh, areas of um, real difficulty, such as Meshach and Kedar, verse 5 and 6 of Psalm 120, essentially lands where people opposed God's people, where people hated the truth of God. Psalm 123, a reminder that uh, it is to our Lord that we lift up our eyes. A reminder that He is the one enthroned in the heavens who can have mercy upon us. And a cry out to Him that He would deliver us from contempt of those who are proud and arrogant against His truth. Psalm 124, recognition that if the Lord had not been on His people's side, there would have been complete and utter destruction. Psalm 125, Reminder that the Lord does protect and does guard His people. Difficulties, battles, pains, distress, despair. Anything but security on earth. Anything but peace on earth. Anything but uh, strong and stable leadership on earth. Sounds very much like today, doesn't it? Chaos, anger, hate, fear, lack of security, question of authority, question of leadership, lack of strength in our leaders, lack of stability in our nation, lack of stability indeed in our world. Show me one place on earth where there is strength and stability and peace. 
And yet, we are reminded in these Psalms that our hope, our strength, and our stability, our security, are not found in kingdoms made by man. They are not found in governors and um, governments and their laws on earth. Strength is found in our great God. He alone is the help of nations. He alone is the happiness of nations. He alone is the hope of nations. If only the nations will see that. And yet that is our call, that is our mission to go and make um, this help, happiness, and hope known. So read with me Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's first of all consider this help of nations. The help of nations. Verse 1, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. Now, particularly we see here the help of the Lord for his people. The help of the Lord specifically for his city, Zion. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. The only help for God's people is God himself. The only one who can provide security, who can provide refuge, who can restore um, good fortune is God himself. If If you struggle with that terminology, if you are a bit of a nihilist or fatalist in your mentality, you you, you need to consider the words of the passage. I'm not the one who says it. The Lord says it. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion... He is saying that there is goodness that can be restored. He is saying that there is good fortune, that there is happiness, that there is help, that there is um, all, all manner that is good, particularly in a material sense. He is speaking of the restoration of God's people to their city. It's very specific. In this psalm, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. We could recount all of the times that the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, that he restored his people to Zion. Uh, We could go through all of the Old Testament and spot time and time again uh, where he did that, both with individuals and with people as a whole. But as he, he, he gave in this psalm, a particular focus on Zion. Let's consider briefly the Lord's work in the nation of Israel and the the people that he called to himself, the Hebrews. It's been rightly said that as by the Lord's permission, the people were led into captivity at different times. So only by his power uh, were they set at liberty. And we see that thread all throughout the Old and New Testament. When the Israelites had lived and were eventually enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, were up to Moses, the Hebrews would have been left in slavery. You've seen the Ten Commandments, um, Charlton Heston's, um, probably, I think you may have seen it anyway. It's about four hours long. You may have seen bits and pieces. I saw the second half. And, um, you know, it paints this picture of, of Moses, many people go away thinking Moses is a great deliverer. Moses is a great Messiah. People may have seen The Prince of Egypt, and it's a, it's a great film. It was the first film I saw in cinema, and um, I, I really quite like it. But people would be forgiven for leaving th- thinking that Moses is a primary hero, because especially people who don't have a view towards God anyway... All they think is, well, 
yes, there's a mystical, spiritual element perhaps in the story, but Moses himself was the main hero. Were up to Moses, the Hebrews would have been left in slavery. Read Exodus. You'll see that very clearly. He did not want to go back to Egypt. He did not want to be the one to lead God's people. But that was not God's plan. It was Yahweh who revealed himself to Moses as the great I Am who let his people go. It was Yahweh who hardened Pharaoh's heart to allow uh, the people to see his mighty hand, to allow the people to see the wonders which he would work in that nation, um, to allow both the Egyptians and the Hebrews to behold his glory in a spectacular way, both in pain and provision. God's providence was clearly seen. It was God who, after the people went into the land and after a time of wandering, after a time of 40 years of going through the wilderness and after a time of conquest under Joshua, it was God who allowed them to be given over once again. For eight years, the Cushites of Mesopotamia ruled God's people because of their idolatry. And God gave Othniel as a judge in Judges 3 to deliver the people. It was God who through Ehud delivered the people from the Moabites after 18 years of servitude. So we already have 26 further years of slavery, of of exile, of bondage that the people have, have been through that God's delivered them from. It was God who through Deborah and Barak delivered the people from Canaanite oppression of 20 years in Judges 4. If you're keeping a tally, we're up to 46 years already. It, It was God who gave the people into the hand of Midian for seven years and then delivered them. It was God who took the people out of their 18-year bondage to the Ammonites, and it was God who gave them up and took them out of a further 40 years under the Philistines. Samson was a mighty man. Samson was a strong man. But Samson's strength was not enough to deliver the people from the Philistines. Samson himself failed and fell a broken wreck. But God raised him up one last time for victory and the deliverance of his people. We could go on and talk of God's grace in delivering his people from the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, and the Greeks. We could talk of victories even in regards to the Romans for a period of time. In all, God raised up and delivered his people through Other people who at times, actually most of the time, were not very strong and they were far from stable. Read Judges. You'll understand what I mean. These people were unwilling so often to stand up and stand against what was was wrong. They were afraid to stand up and be counted for what was right. They were cowardly. But God gave grace to have faith and gave strength. And then finally, Jesus came. After years of back and forth, exile, pain, difficulty, peace and then complacency and then once more punishment, Jesus comes. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to God's people Israel. He he set free from our personal bondage to sin and death. The Messiah of all who will repent and believe. All who will follow him will find life in him. What Moses, Othniel, Ehud, Samson, all of these great people, King David, King Solomon who wrote these psalms and others who wrote, what they could not do, Jesus did. What they could not fix, Jesus did fix. He did accomplish. 
And we see throughout history this, this tapestry of, of God's working and His, His grace uh, as we still await the full restoration into the new kingdom, new heaven and new earth of righteousness. God's time, God's call of the Jews is not yet over. Romans 11 shows that God will restore a remnant of the Jews and will bring them back. And as we look at our society and its absolute implosion on itself, one wonders, is, is the age of the Gentile, the age of the non-Jew, and its um, greater openness to the gospel drawing to a close? And is that time for those people for whom the gospel was to first? The Jew first, will they now be returning to their Messiah? We don't know. But what we do know is that the Lord alone is the help of nations. He is the help of his people, Israel, and he is the help of any other people who look in repentance and faith to him. The Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. He will restore the fortunes of Zion. When he did in the past, the psalmist says, we were like those who dream. In recognizing the help of nations, we need to recognize that the Lord is the happiness of nations. Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Yes, we are glad. We are living in a very unhappy world. We are living in a world that lacks joy. We are living in a society that is angry. It is angry with itself and yet is not connecting the dots, realizing actually its anger against itself is justified because of its rebellion against God. We lack happiness, we lack help, but we try to find our happiness and we try to find our help in anything, anyone, but God. The Lord, the Creator, the Master, the Sustainer, the the Sovereign Ruler of the universe. We we reject, we shut out of our lives and say, no, I'm, I'm going to do it my way. And as long as I can live my life my way, I'm happy. I'm fine. Because my way is the best way for me. My way makes me happy. But what about when your way doesn't make you happy? Well, other people have not been accepting of your way. That's the excuse. And so you continue to burn bridges. You continue to burn bridges. And you try to find identity. You try to find who you are. You try to find your purpose in life. You go from one thing to the next. You go from one job to the next. You go from one one sort of idea of who you are and what you want to do with yourself uh, from one thing to the next, one after the other. You are a rolling stone, a wanderer, someone that the Scripture speaks of as being uh, like a child tossed back and forth here and there. By everything, someone presents something new to you, a new philosophy, a new idea, it makes sense. They have a stat or a survey that actually has a little bit of science in it. You think, oh, that's neat. I'll, I'll adopt that. That might be the trick. That might help. So someone presents um, something about, you know, maybe it's your name. Do you know people actually change their name because they think their name brings some sort of bad energy with it. There's a whole series of, uh, I'm not going to tell you where, but um, a whole whole series of websites and and things which are all about, you know, finding out 
the good and the bad part of your name and the positive or negative energy. And, you know, if, if you have too much negative energy, you, need, you might need to consider changing your name. It highlights the problems with who you are. No, my name was not given to me so that I... It's a name. It's not going to affect that I do this or that I do that. It doesn't dictate my path in life. Well, no, that, that's right, but that's crazy. But, you know, actually the star guides, the star guides, those help, right? The, the, the horoscopes that are printed up with reason in the newspapers every day, they wouldn't put those in there if they weren't legitimate, right? Nothing goes in the newspaper unless it's real, right? We know that's wrong. But people love it. People lap it up. Why? Because it gives some sort of pseudo-spiritual help. You try to find identity. So you look for attention. You want people to approve of your identity. Social media can be a great tool. Smartphones can be a great tool. But these things can also be real weapons. I'm currently reading a book, 12 Ways in Which Your Smartphone is Changing You. And um, it's published um, through Desiring God. It's excellent. It's really quite helpful. It does not slate technology, but it does not um, ignore the real challenges with technology. And one of the sad realities is, is as I'm reading, I'm thinking, this is... It's spot on. You, you look at how people lack assurance, confidence. So what do they do? Let's go on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Let's, let's build up a name. Let's build up a social media name. Let's go on YouTube. Let's, let's, let's just get our name out there. This past week, a young man was shot dead by his partner or wife, I can't remember which, um, but they were together anyway, um, in a stunt in the United States in which um, they wanted to, quote, build their YouTube following. And so they had 30 different neighbors gather to watch as this dangerous stunt, which they knew was dangerous, they said was dangerous, was broadcast live to all manner of people um, the, the lady has a 50-something caliber gun. The man holds up a book. She shoots. They say the book is going to stop it. I mean, wh- wh- what is that? That stupidity. The man dies right there. Over. Done. Why? To build our YouTube following. The, the biggest dream of some generation... Um, Zetters, that's one below my generation, uh, the millennial generation. So anyone born basically from 2000s after. A primary goal that so many generation Zetters have is, is, is to be YouTubers. Why? Because it gets you noticed. It gets you a bit of, of fame. It gets you cash. If you do it well, it gets you cash. People try to find happiness in these things, but they can't. You cannot get enough likes on Instagram, enough um, hearts on Facebook and, uh, and Twitter to actually, to actually satisfy your, your, your soul. It's, it's pointless. If that's your agenda, scrap it. It will not help. The happiness of nations is our Lord Jesus Christ. Our mouth was filled with laughter when the Lord restored our fortunes. Our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. They said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Look, look, here we are in our mess and the Lord has done great things for them. Perhaps the Lord can do great things for us. And yes, this written before Christ 
finds its fulfillment in Christ, an even greater fulfillment. As, as the nations around would, would think, Israel, what is this? These people, this small people, this motley crew of different tribes, these shepherds can stand up to whole armies. They make it difficult for the Assyrians. They make it difficult for the, the Medes and, and Persians. What, what is it with these people? The Egyptians thinking, how are these slaves rising up against us? No man can do the things that we're seeing. Pharaoh let them go. And yet, so small as a nation, so weak to the sight, yet so strong. All nations looking, thinking, we cannot conquer these people. If we do, it's it's pointless. Every nation that conquered them was eventually overthrown. The people were filled with gladness when they returned. And yet, the same gladness that they had when their fortunes were restored is the same happiness that is given when all nations people from anywhere and everywhere who come to repentance and faith can find when they find themselves grafted in to the tree that is God's people. Our mouth was filled with laughter. Our tongue with shouts of joy. If you want to laugh, if you want to have joy, if you you want to experience this peace and to to be able to give thanks, uh, to, to be able to recognize all of the blessings and great things that even you have in this life, even materially. Wake up and see the Lord is King. Wake up and see that the Lord is your Creator and your Master. Return to Him. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. And now the Lord has has brought in people, not just... uh, those of Abraham to whom the blessing was initially promised in Genesis, but he has now brought blessing to the nations, which is what he promised would occur through Abraham and his descendants. The help of nations, the happiness of nations is our Lord. Now we, we need to recognize, if we've not already, that he is the only hope of nations. The psalm closes with the prayer. There's recognition of the Lord's restoration of fortune in the past, but now there's a prayer. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. The, the, the Negev is in the southern parts of Judah, and the <coughs> beds that he's talking about, river beds, were dry. It was very, very dry often. But when the rains came, they would flood. There were, was replenishing of the water. There's um, an allusion to a sudden filling of these dry beds um, in the, the rainy season. And uh, it, was, it was quite a sight to see in what would normally be a desolate and desert area of the nation. Restore our fortunes like that. We are in a desert here. We are dead here. Restore our fortunes. Not fortunes of fame, not fortunes of grandeur, not fortunes of of wealth. Not not, not fortunes uh, that only feed our ego or fortunes that feed our narcissist complex. Not, not fortunes that, um, that just sort of stroke our pride and, and, and big us up, but, but fortunes that cause us to look to God. Fortunes that cause us to praise God. Fortunes that say the Lord restored our fortune. The Lord is the one who restored and, and brought back that time that the locusts devoured. The Lord is the one who did this great work. There's sadness. There's anxiety. There's pain. The Lord can restore. 
Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. If you are in a desert and you don't have rain, you still have to have food. But you don't always have the option of leaving the desert. You go out with your seed to plant and you don't know if the rain is going to come. You don't know if your crops are going to to survive and thrive. The picture here is of one who goes out sowing anyway. He, He prepares for rain. He prepares for blessing. He prepares for restoration. And... He has faith. He weeps tears of faith and sows knowing that perhaps the crop may not grow. But he's trusting that God will provide the rain and nourishment for the seed enough for it to grow. It is like that very often in the Christian life. It is like that in ministry. It is like that in um, seeing a church built up and and, and grow, you go out and you don't really know what's going to happen. Personally, you you live your life, you don't really know what's going to happen day to day. You could live, you could die, you don't know. You you have challenges, you have difficulties that um, it may be health, it may be finance, it may be um, personal issues of some sort. You don't know what all is going to happen, but you feel like everything is caving in around you. You feel like you're in a bit of a desert. You feel a bit dead. Feelings can be deceitful. God is alive. God is our help and our happiness and can give hope. Do not trust your feelings. Look to Jesus who shows you what is good, right, and true. Look to Jesus who is your help, your happiness, and your hope. He will provide. He himself said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Weep, yes, but trust. Weep, yes, but keep working. Weep, yes, but keep walking. Keep doing what you need to do. Keep doing what God has called you to do. Do not give up. Do not give in. The Lord will bless. That one who goes out weeping will come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. From counting our calamities of feeling as though we are in captivity to considering our comforts in Christ. From carrying our burdens to carrying our blessings. That, that, that's the picture of what it is like to recognize our hope, our happiness, our help are in Christ. Previously, we go around and we're, we're always talking about what the problem is. Now we can go around and talk about God's great providence and the peace that he gives. We don't ignore the calamity. We don't ignore the chaos. But we are able to be calm and content within it. We talk about our burdens and we need to talk about our burdens. We need to help bear one another's burdens. We need to be honest with one another about them so we can help one another. But we need to also share our blessings. And rejoice and give thanks when God provides. Something we so often fail to do. We pray, we pour out our cares upon the Lord, but do we... Do we count the blessings that he has given? Eventually, one day, we will go from fully and finally from casting our burdens on the Lord. And we will be before the Lord. And we'll be casting our praise and our crowns before him, having been delivered fully and finally. 
having received his salvation that's been brought to all who are in his new Jerusalem. The final restoration of Zion's fortune will come. And Jesus will be king over all who are there. We will have gone from those periods of rejection and will have full and total restoration in our relationship with God, in our relationship with one another. We will have gone from days where we've been removed from God's peace even, where He has disciplined us and removed us from His, His help perhaps for a season. Or perhaps without experiencing that great calamity, we will have been removed from good relationship with those around us because of our stance we take in Christ. But we'll go from that to a redemption and a reclaim that Christ has worked. We will live with Him in perfect happiness, in perfect peace, in perfect joy. Our mouths will be filled with laughter, our tongues with shouts of joy. And we will say, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. The sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I've sighed for. The fair sweet morn awakes. Dark, dark hath been the midnight, but day spring is at hand. And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The king there in his beauty without a veil is seen. It were a well-spent journey, though seven deaths lay between. The lamb with his fair army doth on Mount Zion stand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. But that he built a heaven of his surpassing love, a little new Jerusalem like to the one above. Lord, take me over the water, hath been my loud demand, take me to my love's own country, unto Emmanuel's land. But flowers need night's cool darkness, the moonlight and the dew. So Christ, from one who loved it, his shining oft withdrew. And then for cause of absence, my troubled soul I scanned, but glory shadeless shineth. In Emmanuel's land. I've wrestled on towards heaven against storm and wind and tide. Now like a weary traveler that leaneth on his guide. Amid the shades of evening while sinks life's lingering sand. I held the glory dawning from Emmanuel's land. With mercy and with judgment my web of time he wove. And I the dews of sorrow were lustered with his love. I'll bless the hand that guided. I'll bless the heart that planned when thrones where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Soon shall the cup of glory wash down earth's bitterest woes. Soon shall the desert briar break into Eden's rose. The curse shall change to blessing. The name on earth that's banned be graven on the white stone in Emmanuel's land. I shall sleep sound in Jesus, filled with his likeness rise, to love and to adore him, to see him with these eyes. Between me and resurrection, but paradise doth stand, then then for glory dwelling in Emmanuel's land. I have borne scorn and hatred. I have borne wrong and shame. Earth's proud ones have reproached me for Christ's thrice blessed name. Where God his seal set fairest, they've stamped the foulest brand. But judgment shines like noonday in Emmanuel's land. They summoned summoned me before them, but there I may not come. My Lord says, come up hither. My Lord says, welcome home. My king at his white throne, my presence doth command. For glory, glory dwelleth 
in Emmanuel's land. Is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, your help? Is he your happiness? Is he your hope? Will you hear those words? Will you hear those words of welcome? Or will you be as the nations that went against God's people, destroyed without hope, without help. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only truth. And he gives the only life worth living.